Hi, it's Don and Nicole from Tax Wars. Welcome back. It's been a while since we've been together to do a uh, interview, um, but we do have a very long-awaited guest with us. Um, his name is John Harbin, a uh, very, very uh, experienced tax attorney. Uh, we're going to be talking specifically with regards to uh, offering compromises, uh, audit reconsiderations, which is very, very important, audit reconsiderations, and also uh, uh, discharging uh, federal tax debt through bankruptcy. So, uh, uh, Nicole, anything you want to add to that? No. <laughs> okay, so, so, John is here with us. We're going to go ahead and bring John on. Uh, John, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm great. Exciting topics for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. I know both. This is yes. the number one topic in most American households. Yes. <laughs> so, what, um, uh, uh, for work, first off, thanks for taking the time uh, to come on and be on the channel. Uh, we're trying to grow it out, and you are probably our most exciting guest. That uh, that we're probably going to have, I think, for some time. Yes. Um, but uh, um, uh, so we want to just be able to jump right into it because we're in the middle of the week. Um, uh, about uh, you, tell us our audience a little bit about your background, uh, how you got into tax resolution, and what even attracted you to work in in tax and and work within the uh, legal system to begin with, John. If you if you might be able to tell our guests. Well, out of college, I was hired by the IRS, and um, they were very good to me, and they encouraged my um, continuing education uh, while I was working for them, and I moved up the ranks from auditor to revenue agent to international tax specialist and large case um, audit division and appeals divisions of the uh, IRS in the uh, greater Los Angeles area. I did a lot of Hollywood um, audits, uh, entertainment audits, um, big uh, industrial uh, companies. And I learned, um, uh, you know, pretty much how the IRS works internally, both in audit and appeals and uh, to some extent collections at the IRS uh, when I was working as a union steward for them as well. Um, when I passed the bar, at, uh, went to Loyola Law School in Los Angeles, passed the bar while I was still working for the IRS, I um, moved on to Ernst & Young, an accounting firm, national accounting firm in Los Angeles for a couple of years, just to ensure that I, get my CPA certificate as well, uh, which I was able to do and also worked with the um, former Los Angeles district director there. So I learned a little bit more about procedures, dealing with counsel and dealing with um, the appeals division at the IRS uh, once I changed hats and started working defense. And from there, I went uh, on my own working in Century City, Los Angeles, South Bay, Los Angeles, and for the past 15 years uh, on my own in Orange County and then San Diego County. Again, primarily representing taxpayers uh, in both state audits and collection issues with both the uh, state of California taxing agencies as well as the IRS. And been, as part of that process, um, over the years, I learned a lot about bankruptcy as an option for taxpayers who had, had got uh, behind in their payments or had some poor accounting advice, uh, got hammered in the audit process. And um, in many cases, the only way out, divorce often or a business failure or an economic downturn. Um, oftentimes business owners would borrow from the government to try to keep things afloat. Then when things fell under, uh, the government was left uh, 
there to come calling to collect what was owed them. So a lot of workouts as part of that process uh, in both the bankruptcy court and outside the bankruptcy court. Um, and that's uh, pretty much what I've done the last 40 years now and, and counting. Wow. Awesome. It's impressive. That, that, that is. It, it's interesting that you've had, you've been on, on both sides and many different arenas because you, you started at the IRS. Uh, you, you, you must be still somewhat familiar with how the agency works. And, and then you've been in private practice and, and you, you have your CPA and, and, and your law degree and the, uh, the IX, IRS experience, uh, uh, starting at the, obviously it sounds like, you know, you just, you start when you were very young there. So that, that's quite impressive. I can't think of very many people who, who have that type of experience, uh, uh to put on their resume. And, and certainly, um, you know, uh, most people would, it's very easy to find someone who, who, who's taken that track. There can't be a lot of, a lot of John Harbins uh, on the planet. <laughs> no. Uh, well, there's a, we're a select group, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when we go to our, in the old days, when you'd actually go to meetings, you know, it was, it was a very select group. And, you know, going back to law school, you'd sit in those tax classes, there might be three or four people in the class. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty narrow group, uh, niche of, uh, of tax attorneys out there, especially dealing with the government. What, what is, um, do you have any, uh, uh, what I find is uh, many people aren't familiar with the audit reconsideration process. Uh, any, many, uh, even many tax professionals aren't. Um, I mean, they all know what I, you do. You can request the audit reconsideration. They don't know the process, and they can't articulate it to their clients. Um, could you just kind of, kind of explain the, you know, the federal tax audit reconsideration for because this is primarily. Uh, our channel is geared towards more tax professionals than taxpayers. So uh, we know a lot of tax practitioners who, who, uh, who would be completely stumped as to what to do or how to even go about in an IRS uh, audit reconsideration yeah. or even at the state level. So kind of if you can just kind of shed some uh, uh, foreground on that and then uh, Kind of tell us what your what your experiences have been in, in audit reconsiderations, John. Yes, yeah, so audit reconsideration comes into play when an audit's going on, and for whatever reason, the accountant doesn't respond, the taxpayer doesn't respond, and it gets sent, or and a statute might be getting closed for assessment, and the audit uh, there's a poor communication between the government and the taxpayer. And all of a sudden, the government goes ahead and issues what's called a statutory notice of deficiency, certified mail. It's sent to the last known address of the taxpayer. Oftentimes, the taxpayer's getting um, uh, deluge with numerous mails from the government, and they don't know the significance of that particular document, which gives the taxpayer 90 days in which to petition to the tax court. And if they don't do so, or they don't know the process, or they don't go to hire a tax attorney to file a petition in tax court, then the, um, then the uh, proposed audit becomes final. And then they're dealing with collections. And oftentimes, they don't even know what's going on, or they think their accountant has dealt with it, and, and something's happened. And and it wasn't dealt with properly. And all of a sudden, a collector's coming to their door, knocking on the door, asking for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, oftentimes on a mistake. You know? And uh, it's one, one part of the process is stopping collections from trying to collect taxes that aren't really owed, but on the books are said to be owed. And then 
primarily to deal with exam division to go ahead and get all the taxpayer records and submit those to the exam division and get you know, a second bite of the apple with exam to try to uh, get to the bottom of what's actually owed by the taxpayer. And oftentimes it's a significant reduction in tax that they oftentimes can pay it if, if it's the correct amount. So the process involves stopping collection on one end and dealing with exam on the other. And when you're dealing with exam on an audit reconsideration, you have to put together all the documents, put them in a nice orderly fashion and submit them uh, by mail to the um, service center uh, that uh, uh, oversees that particular taxpayer. Okay, fantastic, John. Um, any any particular uh, thing that uh, tax practitioners should be aware of when doing audit reconsiderations, and you know, in your professional opinion, that you experienced that you know when you when you first encountered uh, the IRS and, and submitting audit reconsiderations, what what they what people, uh, particularly tax professionals, should be aware of. That the that the, where the challenges are at in the process. Well, it's it's like dealing with a dam that's overflowing with the the holes in many different parts of the dam. So you're dealing, like I uh, uh, stated earlier, you're dealing with collections on one end. You're maybe dealing with a service center on the other. Maybe you're even dealing with a a revenue agent or tax auditor on the th who originally did the audit. Maybe they're going to get called back into the into the uh, exam process. So it's it's really finding out who's who can handle it, get it to the right people, and being able to follow up with them. Um, that's the challenge when you're dealing with the government. Oftentimes, there's calls that aren't returned, mail that isn't seem to be opened or reviewed in a timely manner. You receive correspondence that says, give us six months to review this. At the same time, you're trying to get collections to not you know, see somebody's home, seize their bank account, seize their business. So that's the challenge of dealing with the different parts of the government and and keeping them moving forward in a positive way. Right. And we're, we're not even talking about the difficulty of dealing with the client taxpayers. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, people get upset when they get uh, mail uh, that's not positive. Uh, and like I said, you might be dealing with three different uh, parts of the government and you may be satisfied one. and. The other part is is attacking in it from another way. And now, uh, 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 on that same note, uh, uh, most of the most many tax professionals, like as I stated earlier, they they uh, they they don't uh, they don't really go after our challenge challenge uh, themselves to do the audit reconsiderations for their clients. Um, as if they, 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 you know, that's they, they just say, oh, we don't even, I don't even want to go there, you know, and they will, they, they, they don't go and and, and fight for it because it, it can be be challenging and and there's so many there's so many moving parts that you have to keep keep in place. So, um, is it something that you uh, that that those cases automatically come uh, often come to you or do you see uh, many times where there is an opportunity, uh, do you look harder for the opportunity to, to do an audit reconsideration for, for specific tax, types of taxpayers, John? Well, I think some uh, oftentimes on audit uh, recon, um, the professional may have been involved to begin with. Maybe it's uh, they prepared the return. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, they don't want to let go to uh, with the positions that they've taken or 
how they handled the audit to begin with. So you don't oftentimes they're the referral source. So you're not going to throw the professional under the bus. But at the same time, you're you're going to apply your expertise to maybe do things a little differently than how the professional handled it to get a better result for the for the mutual client. Very good. Very good. And, and, uh, and obviously you've done uh, audit reconsiderations for both businesses and personal corporate audit reconsiderations as well. Yes, I, I, I can think of uh, one recently where uh, the taxpayer sold their residence, million dollar a property. Um, they had inherited the property, so there wasn't going to be, and they lived in the property for several years, so there wasn't going to be a significant uh, tax, but without the um, information uh, responded to by the government, the government was coming in and saying they owed you know, half a million dollars of tax penalties and interest. At the same time, they had co-owned the, with their relative and, the re and they had not reported the sale on their tax return. That was a mistake wow. on their part. But uh, the relative had had reported their portion of the sale, and uh, the government had accepted that return. And it was just a case of trying to get the government to understand the two different returns, um, how the one had made a mistake. It was an innocent mistake because they thought the other party would be reporting the entire sale. Um, when when all said when all was said and done, the, the taxpayer owed you know neck, a de minimis amount, and um, but it was a challenge uh, stopping collections for the uh, over a year that it took for audit reconsideration to actually work the audit, review the documents, and make the abatement of tax. Oh, fabulous! Well, I. As much as I could go on with this subject, <laughs> audit reconsiderations, uh, because I find it fascinating, um, uh, I, I want to. I just want to uh, go to the next uh, uh, area and uh, you know lean on your expertise with regards to uh, bankruptcy. And I, I you know, I, I've been doing this for a long time. So is Nicole, and I'm astounded how how many tax professionals uh, do not especially in tax resolution, fail to uh, uh, make their taxpayer client aware that bankruptcy is an option and explain it to them thoroughly. They, 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 they go, well, you know, I'm not going to make any money doing a bankruptcy for this person. So I'll do the, you know, uh, I'll just do the offer when the offer is in the correct, correct application uh, to, to get the, the client the best results. And also vice versa. I have to say, I have seen, I, I've had clients come to us and I have seen where the bankruptcy attorney, <laughs> in many ways, this is very frustrating. The bankruptcy attorney misled the, the, uh, their client and, and client, the client was, was led to believe that that their their taxes were going to be you know discharged in bankruptcy. Now I know that's you know uh, I know what the attorneys are saying and doing, but it, it's it's so frustrating when they come. Yeah, we filed bankruptcy, and the tax attorney said that our all all of our tax that would be discharged in the bankruptcy. And you know, two three years later, here they are with penalties and interest, and possibly their CSET CSET dates reset because of the bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. It was very frustrating going through 2000, uh, 10, 11, 12, where you could just constantly see this. So, um, uh, uh, what what are your what are your? Uh, so obviously, this is an area of practice that you 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 uh, have focused on and had great success. Why do you think most tax professionals don't even recommend? Uh, bankruptcy to their to their clients. Any well, if they're a, well, if they're accountants, they can't file a bankruptcy. Right. <laughs> you have to be an attorney to file the bankruptcy. So 
you have to be an attorney in that jurisdiction. So, uh, if, you know, I've filed bankruptcies in California, over 500 bankruptcies in 30 plus years, almost all tax motivated. Uh, but um, I have to ask permission uh, from a Nevada attorney if I want to file a bankruptcy in Nevada or Arizona or Oregon or uh, any other state. So, and I have to become well versed on their particular ex bankruptcy exemptions okay. and their particular uh, laws. So, um, uh, so that's one uh, fa uh, facet. Is the uh, one one point is that the accountants cannot file the bankruptcy. As far as the bankruptcy attorneys uh, imp improperly advising when a tax uh, is dischargeable or not, well, you know that's that's on them. They should they should be aware. Uh, they they can go to seminars and and learn about uh, discharge of taxes and bankruptcy. It's fairly straightforward. It, Tax has to be more than three years old. Uh, it has to have been on a filed return. It's more than two years old. And the tax has to have been assessed more than 240 days before the filing of bankruptcy. And then there's, um, there's uh, tolling uh, issues that make it a little more complicated. If, if taxpayer filed, a client filed a bank, uh, an offer in compromise that uh, didn't, wasn't accepted, that can toll those rules. Uh, uh, if, uh, if they filed a collection due process appeal, that can also toll those rules. So they had a prior bankruptcy that can toll those rules as well. Um, so there's, it, gets, it can be a little complicated. Uh, the even more complicated part of bankruptcy is uh, the uh, receiving the bankruptcy discharge and actually meeting the rules for discharging taxes is only one part of the puzzle when you're dealing with the with the government because oftentimes if you're a property owner or a business owner you have assets that the government could seize or they, they'll file a, a, uh, a tax lien. And all that they have to do to file a tax lien is send it to the county recorders uh, where you reside. They don't have to go to court. They don't have to sue you. And it's a, it's a, and it's a tremendous strong instrument for the government to collect their taxes. So if you own a property, let's say with some equity, and it's maybe uh, within the homestead exemption, which has been significantly increased in California in recent years. Um, you might meet all the rules with regards to discharge of taxes. The home may not be subject to seizure by a bankruptcy trustee because of your homestead exemption. You can come out of bankruptcy, have your discharge and the IRS comes calling wanting their taxes paid and you say, oh no, they were discharged in bankruptcy. Here's my piece of paper that says they were discharged. And the IRS may say, well, that's well and, and, and true and correct, but we still have a tax lien against your home and we want, you, we want to collect against the equity in the home. So it's, a, it's, a, um, it's both discharging the tax and bankruptcy and dealing with the tax lien is a, a double-edged process uh, that, that you need to concern yourself uh, when you take a client in, into bankruptcy with outstanding tax debt. Yes. Um, um, uh, I think we, we're going to, Nicole has a case that's very similar where we believe that uh, getting, getting the tax lines off for a particular client. <laughs> so so it, it can be challenging there. Uh, and, and the government important. makes mistakes. Oh. The government makes mistakes all the time. Yes. Um, oh, I have. Don't, I, don't say that. Don't, don't I have say that. one where we've you only know, seen it once or twice. <laughs> I have one where the the taxpayer uh, was an elderly gentleman. Um, 
He has a nice pension. He was a, a retired physician. Um, he took his, his uh, some significant money and put it into a, a, a poor investment and, and lost, uh, lost uh, pretty much everything he owned. And at the same time, uh, he borrowed uh, uh, basically from the government to, uh, to fund this investment. So he ended up owing a lot of tax with no assets remaining except for a large pension that he's receiving every month. So he met with me. I took him through. I, I explained the situation for him. He was going to have to wait a couple of years in order to file bankruptcy to discharge all the taxes. And we did that. And it was painful for about a year because he, he had this large pension coming in. He was having to pay the government uh, anywhere from five to $7,000 a month for a year waiting for the taxes to be dischargeable. But then he finally met that date and we filed bankruptcy. He went smoothly through bankruptcy and lo and behold, he thought his million five hundred thousand dollar of tax debt had been wiped out. But lo and behold, the IRS came back and says, oh, well, no, uh, the one year um, because of some tolling rules, um, a, you filed the bankruptcy two days early and he still owes $50,000. And I went back and forth and back and forth with them explaining why we met the, even factoring in the tolling rules, we were fine, but I couldn't prevail at those lower levels. Our only opportunity would be to go back into bankruptcy court, sue the government and incur all that litigation. And he would have won in my opinion, we had the transcripts, we did the toll lane. We were very comfortable with our position, but he didn't want to fight. So uh, uh, right now we're in the process, we're trying to do an offer and compromise on that last 50. I, I don't know if that's gonna work or not because even though he has a decent income, he has large spousal support. He has, uh, uh, you know, significant taxes with regards to that income. So he may, he may be able to get an offer approved. He is you know, 80 years old, so that's a factor, but we'll see. But again, it's a government mistake. We know it's a mistake and we just, you know, he doesn't want to sue. Uh, he doesn't want to go through that pressure and aggravation at this point in his life. So I have another one wow. now. I have another one now where uh, I have the transcript. The, tax, the taxpayer filed the return, says he owes the tax. It was assessed on the return. It's a million dollars of tax on that return that he, he didn't pay. And about two years later, the government audits that return and says he owes an extra $2,000 from that return. Instead of a million dollars, he owes a million $2,000. All right. And that assessment, that assessment uh, only, uh, uh, I didn't even realize he had that extra $2,000 assessment. And um, that was assessed. And six months later, we filed his bankruptcy. And the government right now is saying, well, you didn't wait 240 days for that tax to be discharged. So he still owes a million too. And, I, <laughs> and I says, what are you talking about? I'll agree with you. He owes $2,000, <laughs> but the other million, I think was wiped out in bankruptcy. Well, right now they're, they're forcing me to sue them in bankruptcy court over that million dollar issue. Oh, wow. And, and so we're gonna do it, so. Wow, so the government <laughs> does make mistakes. <laughs> so we'll, we'll ask for some attorney's fees on that one. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. 
So, um, uh, uh, well, I, I think we, we've covered what we can timeline as far as bankruptcy. Last thing, uh, since yeah. we've already stepped in that area, of the offering compromise. Um, first off, you know, uh, uh, a lot of people, more and more, you know, from the, over the past, I'd say the past 25, 30 years, the, uh, the average Joe's six pack public taxpayer has become aware of this thing called an offering compromise or what tax, uh, uh, lay, lay people will call a, uh, a settlement, uh, an IRS settlement. Uh, or fresh start which, program. <laughs> or, the, or the fresh start program that you're supposed to be But, um, uh, can you just, you just uh, since you were, I guess uh, you've been, a, you were a star at the IRS. Um, uh, in the back in the nineties, you know, taxpayers didn't know about offering compromises. The average taxpayer. I mean, obviously, people who worked in finance or business or wealthier people may have had money and tax attorneys, uh, uh, you know, in there working with them constantly. Um, uh, do you do you recall exactly when uh, the offering compromise was was uh, announced uh, through the IRS and and and, and letting the, the public know about it? And do you know when when the when uh, uh, the IRS as as a, a form of resolution started to become very popular within the the, the tax the tax uh, tax community. Do you have, have any idea? Or anything well, offer and compromises have been on the books for 50 years or more. Um, I guess, uh, you know, they only became more prominent uh, with all the, all the late night advertising uh, <laughs> over the past 20 years. Um, but I find um, there's a lot of, uh, the public in general has misinformation about an offer and compromise. They think, oh, just offer up pennies on the dollar and that, that's, that's all that it takes. And I always tell people, it's, it's not how much you owe, it's how much you can pay and how much the government can collect and other circumstances, your age, your education, what have you. I had one gentleman, no, no question, he was a criminal, and he was on the run, he was living in Mexico, and he had run up easily $20 million of trust fund uh, recovery penalties, the monies that he had taken out of his employees' paycheck and not turned over to the government. I mean, a real criminal. And... Um, he was on the run. He ran off to Mexico. He's living in Mexico. He's on the books. He's teaching English, making $10,000 a year. And that's, uh, he's getting by in Mexico City with that amount of income. The government, even though he owed this $20 million, I did tax returns for the last three years, bank statements for the last year evidence uh, of how he was living and the government accepted $10,000 on an offer and compromise on that $20 million debt on a debt that wasn't dischargeable in bankruptcy because trust fund debt is not dischargeable. So that was a case where it wasn't how much he owed or the circumstances of how he got uh, such a large assessment against him. It's what was the government ever gonna collect from this guy? And um, so I, when people come to me and they have a home with significant equity or they make hundreds of thousands of dollars in income and I tell them the government will let them live on five to 7,000 a month net and that's it uh, based on the um, financial standards allowances. Well, you can do the, the math and the formula and oftentimes I'm advising people, you know, you really don't qualify for an offer and compromise. Let's look at our other options, whether bankruptcy is an option, whether um, a payment plan is an option. What's the statute of limitations for collection? Oftentimes these are old debts 
Uh, they've been on the books for years. The IRS only has 10 years to collect the debt from the time it's been assessed. Maybe there's only a year or two left on the statute. And, and there's maybe not a lot to, to collect from this taxpayer. You might say to them, well, under an offer, you're gonna to have to come up with this large lump sum payment. Maybe we're just gonna do a payment plan uh, for the short period of time that the uh, statute uh, uh, remains for the government to collect. Now that doesn't work with the state of California because for all intents and purposes, they don't have a statute of limitations for collection. It, there's one that says it's 20 years on the books, but they can always extend that with little uh, yeah. <laughs> adjustments. Uh, another, uh, uh, Another says it's a 30 year statute. Uh, uh, the state of California is uh, difficult when dealing with statute. Plus they collect their tax. They're out there in your face uh, yes. <laughs> wanting, wanting to collect. So uh, um, whereas the IRS tends to sleep on the sleep at times. So we just call the FTB the Hotel California. <laughs> Taxpayers can check out anytime they like, but they can never leave. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, I have a client that owns from 1993. They're still trying to get the money. <laughs> right. yeah. What I find interesting about the state of California is the state of California seems to have greater reach in terms of, of, of their uh, their greater reach than other states do in terms of their authority and their ability to collect. They seem to be you know, go way outside of the, the, the boundaries of the state of California. Uh, and and uh, I, I don't know how successful they are at it, but uh, they'll go to taxpayers in other states constantly and, and, uh, and, and find them and let them know that they owe the state of California. and. And uh, threaten to lien levy and garnish, uh, even if they don't have any income or assets inside the state of California. And sometimes they seem to be successful at that. But uh, well, there are, you know, there's only like four or five major financial institutions in the country. <laughs> so people are banking usually at one of those, and they'll just levy. And the bank doesn't want to get involved and, and say to the state of California, hey, this is a Texas bank account, it's Texas taxpayer, you have no authority. They're not gonna get in the middle of that. They're just gonna honor the levy. Yeah, yes, that, that, uh, that they're, they're, they're very, very aggressive. But we, we love the state of California, especially <laughs> the politicians here. Hi, Gavin. Hi, Gavin, how are you? <laughs> so um, uh, just to kind of wrap things up with regards to, uh, uh, offering compromises. Um, what do you, yeah, you got any interesting stories? I know a lot of people, especially in the business, when they when they're early, early, you know, practitioners that are new to the industry, and they get their first really, you know, challenging offering compromise through, and they're just so excited. Um, uh, what was what, what was what was the uh, the the offer that you were able to get through that you thought was very challenging might not happen? You chose to submit it and and you found out that it was it wasn't as challenging as 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 uh, perceived. Any stories like that, John? Well, I'm not sure so much as a, it's an offer, but it, it is a it is a uh, it was more a bankruptcy related case, uh, but um, it was a case where. We were in a chapter 13 bankruptcy for her husband and wife. And um, the, husband, the, the, the husband was a criminal. There's no question about it. And the wife was <laughs> a very sweet lady and they always filed everything separate. So she knew her husband well enough to do that. Um, and then they got behind on some payroll taxes in his business. And he was also a problem with filing tax returns. And we put them into a bankruptcy and they were in the bankruptcy and they had some equity in their home. And while in bankruptcy, uh, their home equity exploded uh, and increased significantly. 
and um, he had some health issues and he died unexpected, unexpectedly 50 years old in the bankruptcy. She was distraught. I said, well, um, let's just pay off uh, uh, the, the small amount that's owed in the bankruptcy and let's get you out of bankruptcy. And she did that and she got a bankruptcy discharge. And um, about two years later, she was going to sell her home because she couldn't afford it anymore. And she went to sell it. And lo and behold, at escrow, the IRS came in and says, oh no, you're not getting your half million dollars that you need, that you're, uh, we're gonna take it all. And that's what they did. Even though the tax lien ex became extinguished upon her husband's death. And I advised the revenue officer of that and he didn't accept that. And I had to sue the government for, over that. And this, the suit went on and on and they were fighting me and fighting me. And finally we prevailed. And it was a settlement. We didn't have to go before the judge. It, it finally settled. Um, and that process took about three years, if you can believe it. Oh, wow. And, uh, and, uh, and then I said, well, you have to ask for some money back. And we did that. We did that all timely. It took another four years for her to actually get her check. But seven, seven years after her husband's death, she received some big checks, uh, almost uh, the entire amount that they had taken. And um, wow. that was very satisfying. Because, wow. So, so you, you can <laughs> fight City that's, Hall. <laughs> that's exciting. Yeah, you can, you, you can fight City Hall. Is, you can. Is what you're saying, yeah. You just, you just have to live long enough to do it. You do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, seven years. Well, she was in her 50s, so. <laughs> okay. What's encouraging uh, to hear you give examples like that? Yes. Is that, you know, uh, uh, in, in, uh, I, I don't know how old you are, but I, I assume that we're fairly close in age. I'm in my, I'm in my mid-60s now. Um, is that, uh, I don't know that, um, you know, that uh, uh, the generations coming up, I don't, I don't know if they have that type of stick to itiveness to see a, to stay with a case for more than um, oh, uh, uh, you know, seven days, right? <laughs> <laughs> in six seconds, yes. Uh, uh, but to, to stay with a client, a taxpayer that long, and and constantly fighting, constantly fighting for what you know to be be correct, even when you know the government's wrong, but they're not budging. Uh, where do you find that the 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 uh, the patience, the 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 foresight, the ability to uh, and the the love of of doing your work? Where where, where does that come from? <laughs> or just you just care about people and taxpayers? Is that it? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, I remember a former uh, AUSA uh, tech, uh, saying he knew my brother very well, who's a longtime fraud investigator for the government. And uh, he got to know me pretty well on a case. And he just said, you know, we'd, we'd really like to meet your mother. You know, we're so proud of the two of you. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, fantastic, John. Listen, uh, we're, we're, we're well over 30 minutes here. It's, uh, the time has just flew by. Yes. Uh, could you do us a favor uh, first, just for, just for our audience? You know, we, it's mostly made up of tax professionals. Could you just um, uh, let them know if you're so inclined uh, to uh, uh, let uh, let our audience know how they can get a hold of you, uh, your your website address, uh, an email address, if so inclined, and or a phone number. Yeah, sure. Uh, John Harbin Tax Law at Verizon.net is my web is my email. John Harbin Tax Law at Verizon.net. Uh, my websites. John Harbin Taxlaw.com. John Harbin 
taxlaw.com or they can reach me 24 seven on my cell at 310-701-9522, 310-701-9522. Fantastic, John. And um, uh, we would definitely love to uh, have you back in the not too distant future. Uh, I, I, I would love to hear some more of these these stories, especially the ones that you just told at the end here. Yes. That's fascinating. That is such fascinating uh, information, um, and, uh, and 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 the experience that you've gone through, and uh, that's just incredible. Um, uh, once again, uh, uh, as people reach reach out to you, uh, there may be some taxpayers who might reach out to you as well. Um, if you, for some reason, you forget the information, you can always contact me and Nicole here at Tax Force USA. Be sure to hit the like button, uh, subscribe, and by all means, comment. Uh, any comments that you put in, you can address directly to, to, to John if you, if so inclined, and then uh, we can we can inform him uh, at some other point. Uh, John, do you? you uh, uh, do you think we could have you back on the show uh, before the uh, close of the uh, close of the year? Glad to help in any way. Okay, fantastic. I know our audience will look forward to it. Yeah, maybe right. we can get some insider information on the IRS. Uh, <laughs> I think all of my friends are retiring by this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, John. Listen, thank you so much. And uh, look forward to seeing you back on the channel with us very, very soon. All right. Thanks yes, a lot. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye for Bye now. Bye.